Our first speaker, Chuck Marone of Strong Towns. He is the founder and president. Um, Strong Towns is a national media organization that supports the development of resilient cities, towns, and neighborhoods. He holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning and is the author of Thoughts on Building Strong Towns and a World-Class uh, Transportation System. So with that, I will give it to Chuck. Thank you, thank you. It's really nice to be here, I appreciate it. I went to, I, I'm, I'm from Minnesota. I actually grew up on a farm homesteaded by my great-great-grandparents about two and a half hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And if you had asked me when I was a kid what I was gonna do when I got older, I was gonna be a musician. That's what I wanted to do, that's what my passion was. And I, when I got to the end of high school, I actually had a scholarship offer to uh, pursue music. And I, I, I was such a serious young man, I turned it down. And I went to school uh, at the University of Minnesota and got an engineering degree. In 1995, I, I got out of engineering school and I moved back to my hometown. I married uh, the girl that I had been dating since junior high and uh, started to work for the local engineering firm. And I essentially had made it, right? I mean, that was, that was it. I, I, I had accomplished what I wanted to. I, I started doing civil engineering projects. And for those of you that maybe don't know a lot about what engineers do, we uh, design the roads and the streets and the sidewalks and the sewer systems and the pipes underground. And when you become an engineer, there's a, there's a four-year process of, it's a, essentially an apprenticeship. You're called an engineer in training and you work for four years uh, under a licensed engineer before you can go and get your license. And they teach you how things are done, right? So I did inspection work, I did drafting work, I was out building you know, different municipal kind of engineering projects, all under the tutelage of you know, a, a whole cadre of engineers. I was not a very good engineer. I kept asking questions that nobody had answers for. And at one point, uh, we got to a, a project, I'm gonna give you this one as like a snapshot of, of what kind of made me walk away from engineering, or at least take a different track. I was working with a city uh, that had a, this is a very, very small town. I understand, I, I work in a very, live in a very rural area. It's a very small town, about 250 people. They uh, called me up because their sewage treatment facility was overflowing and potentially was going to run into, tear down the bank and run into the river which would have been a, a, an environmental catastrophe. I did a study, and a study, this sounds more glamorous than it was, I went out uh, at one in the morning and pulled every manhole cover in town and figured out where they were getting water leaking into their system. And I found uh, a 300 foot stretch of pipe that had settled and cracked and the ground, it was under the groundwater, and so the water just ran in. All this clean water ran down and was filling up their, their treatment facility. Went to them with the solution. I was really thought I was very brilliant. It was, it was uh, gonna be $300,000 to fix and repair this pipe. They said, well, Chuck, that's great. Thank you, we really appreciate it. Uh, we had $15,000 in our reserve account. We spent it hiring you. Uh, we have a total budget of $80,000 a year. We don't have the money to fix this pipe, so sorry, uh, you're gonna have to go find someone who can help us with this. Well, there are all kinds of agencies, economic development uh, agencies and, and what have you, that give grants and loans to local cities. So I, I went and talked to all these. And what do they say? They said, well, Chuck, this sounds a lot like maintenance to us. This doesn't sound like something that we're interested in. This sounds like something that is the responsibility of, of the local city. And so, you know, I, I, I went back and I kind of, delved into this and put my mind to work. And I thought, well, all these places are interested in environmental damage and economic development and, and all this. What I wound up doing is I made a huge project out of it. We uh, put together a $2.6 million project to 
expand the size of their treatment facility, run pipes all over the place to hook a whole bunch of people up, create a new business park to attract new business, and repair the little pipe under the street. The cost was $2.6 million. I went back to all these funding agencies again, and what was their reply? Well, this seems like a great project. <laughs> You've got a pending environmental catastrophe. You have a poor, underserved population. Uh, you have the chance for economic development. You're going to create jobs. And the city wound up getting $2.5 million in grant. And then the remainder of the project funded for them uh, with a low interest loan over 40 years. These were the kind of things that I saw over and over and over again. And it occurred to me that what we were doing, what I was doing as an engineer, and by the way, got a huge bonus from my employer. The city actually had Chuck Marone Day uh, where they you know, invited people in and put up a tent and roasted hot dogs and all that. Uh, it occurred to me that what I was being encouraged to do as a professional was take a city that didn't have uh, the resources to maintain 300 feet of pipe and as a solution give them 10,000 more feet of pipe. I was taking an insolvent place and making their insolvency problem way, way worse. I was buying them some time, but I was ultimately making their problem way worse. I had the opportunity, as I'm struggling with these kind of engineering problems, my sense was that this was just really bad planning. And I actually had an opportunity to go back to graduate school and get a degree in planning. It's funny because in engineering school, we make fun of planners. And in planning school, we make fun of engineers. They're both equally funny jokes, by the way. But I went back to school and got a planning degree. And my thought was, if I can just get out in front of these really bad decisions, we won't be asking engineers to do such stupid things. We can actually get engineers to do really smart things. And so I, I went to graduate school. And shortly after I started, I had cities start to call me and say, would you, would you come and help us out with this or with that problem? And by the time I got done with graduate school, I had built a planning firm. Uh, within a couple years after graduation, I had five offices, 13 staff, and we were doing planning projects all over the state of Minnesota. Our mission as an organization was to change the way planning is done in Minnesota. How successful was I? <laughs> Not as successful as I was as an engineer, right? Uh, we got contracts, we did work, we hired people, people were generally happy. But did anything really change? No, it, it, it didn't. And it didn't because I, f I found out that as a planner, I had certain other constraints. See, as an engineer, I couldn't do the upfront planning, but as the planner, I couldn't do any of the implementation. I couldn't do any of the, the things that made stuff work. And not only that, but I actually had very little say in the context and the system in which I was working. And by the time I got to the mid-2000s, I had realized that the planning profession was just as broken as the engineering profession. It was literally was, was a, a, a creature of dogma in terms of zoning and land use regulation and what have you. And that I was, in many ways, powerless to change it. I actually, at this point, became really fascinated in the finance of how our places worked. And I started to realize that uh, a lot of what I was running into was just the fact that the numbers didn't work. They didn't add up. That little project that I gave you as, as an illustration is an extreme example. But even when I started to look at other projects, they didn't make any sense at all. I'm going to do a, a presentation here later on today called the Curbside Chat, where I go through some of the data that we have put together. But I'll give you one of the first ones. I was, I was uh, huh. My own road that I lived on, that my wife and I built a house on, uh, I got our tax statement one day. And I looked at our tax statement, and this was a city that I had worked with. I knew their budget intimately. I knew that they didn't have any money to do anything, that they were struggling. And I looked at my tax statement, and I realized that the amount of tax that I was paying to the city would not cover even the cost of plowing the snow off my road, let alone fixing the road, keeping the parks maintained, mowing the ditches, do, do, you know, doing all the things that say, holding elections, all the things that cities do, my taxes weren't covering even a, a tiny, tiny portion of that. We pay pretty high taxes. How, how is this possible? 
How is this possible? And I realized that I was illiterate when it came to finance. And so I started reading, and I probably in, in two years read 50, 60 books about finance and, and, and economics, everything from you know, the, the, the very theoretical stuff all the way up to kind of some of the crazier stuff. I actually got a CNBC subscription in my office. I don't have cable, but I, you can subscribe to it online. It's ridiculously expensive. But I got that for about 18 months just to listen every day to the conversation. Not because there's anything intelligent going on in CNBC. There really is not. But you get the language, right? Like when interest rates go up, why does that make bond prices go down? Right? Why? Well, <laughs> when you start to ask these questions, it's not intuitive to you. Uh, des you know, absorbing the language of this stuff is really helpful. And by the time we entered 2008, I was uh, quite perplexed about where things were. If you remember 2008, we had a bank fail early in the year. We had uh, a, a, a rescue, in a sense, of that bank, or a bailing out of people who stood to lose a lot of money in that transaction. Uh, we then had the housing market turn and the whole subprime mortgage thing start to bubble up. We had another bank fail. We were told by Congress that if we did not give Wall Street a trillion dollars within 48 hours, there would be no food on the store shelves. And we were kind of subjected to an election cycle uh, that in, in many ways for me was bewildering because it didn't address any of the issues that I saw as fundamental. And so at the end of 2008, I started to write. One of the, for, for anybody who is a writer, writing is uh, a little bit like exercise. My wife is, is a jogger. She likes to go jogging. And when she has something milling around in her brain, she'll go for a, a long jog. And she'll come back and it's like her mind is cleared and she can talk about things. For me, it's, it's not exercise, it's writing. And when you have to sit down and put your thoughts on, uh, you know, uh, on paper and actually go through them, it's a very kind of self-organizing kind of exercise. And so what I realized in 2008 was that I was seeing a different world than a lot of people. And the world that I was seeing didn't make sense. And so I actually had the theory that perhaps I was crazy. My, my wife has this statement. Uh, she says, if everybody around you is crabby, it's probably you that is crabby. If everybody around you seems crazy, it's probably you that is crazy. So I had the idea that maybe I'm just not with it. And so I started to write. And I disciplined myself. I said, I'm going to write about these things three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 a.m. I'm going to publish three days a week. And it was amazing because I, I started to write and I would share it with just a, a small group of kind of professional colleagues writing about cities and what I was seeing and really trying to answer the question, why are our cities struggling financially? Why are they going broke? After a year, two friends of mine uh, came to me and said, Chuck, uh, this is really amazing stuff. And we think that you should start a, a nonprofit organization. Um, I, I said, I, I don't have time to start a nonprofit. I'm not interested in running a nonprofit. I said, it's okay. You just keep writing. We'll fill out the paperwork and get it going. A year later, we had a 501c3. And as I entered 2011, I got a call from a local foundation who said, we've been reading your stuff, and we think this is really interesting. Would you come up and tell us what your nonprofit is all about? And I had this kind of moment where I said, I, I'm running a nonprofit. I don't even know what we're about, right? We're about me writing right now. So I put together uh, an idea of, you know, here, here, here's what I see going on, and here's uh, what I think we need to do differently. And they gave me three years of startup money to actually go out and share what we call the Strong Towns message. Today, we have uh, over 13, almost 1,400 members in every state, all across Canada and Mexico, uh, worldwide, talking about how we can build cities to be financially more productive and at the same time improve people's lives in the process. There's 
kind of three big things that I, I, I want to kind of leave as a, as, a, as a thought for you in terms of framing where we're at today and, 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 and how to bring these conversations forward. Because I, I see, as I've, as I've done this, I've seen a lot of people doing the things that I'm doing. A lot of people who have an, an, an insight, a passion, a thing that they're uh, really, really motivated about start to talk about it and share it and have it balloon into something else. I think there's, there's, there's three things going on today that uh, affect this. The first is that we have, this, um, we have this crisis of big. Uh, Nico Mele wrote a book called The End of Big. I, I highly recommend it. There's another a guy who I've read everything he's written called Nassim Taleb who wrote the book... Uh, Fooled by Randomness, and then The Black Swan, and then Anti-Fragile. I recommend that you read all three. What they talk about in the, is the, uh, the, the large systems that we have created, really a byproduct of things that happened in the Depression and World War II, allowed us to accomplish a lot of things in a very short period of time, but come with their own fragility, their own uh, kind of disconnectedness. You can see in things like the Brexit vote, you can see in things like the conversation we're having in our election cycle, that there's a whole lot of, uh, you can even see in the horrible tragedies that happened this week in my home state uh, and in other parts of the country, you can see this disconnect between the large systems that we have to govern ourselves, the large systems that we have to run our economies, and the way we actually live our everyday lives. It's a very different relationship than what we had, say, 100 years ago, where things were very, very localized. Very localized systems have their own disadvantages. Parochialism is one of them. But very large systems have very strong disadvantages, too, in that they tend to get out of touch with people. As our systems uh, shift, and they are shifting, what we see is that there's a lot of opportunity for people, and there's a lot of need and demand for people at the very local level to take ownership of their places. So one is this idea of this crisis of big, kind of prompting us to think very small. The second kind of goes with that. The world of the big, the specialist is king. In the world of the local, the, the generalist governs. Uh, I'm an engineer, I'm a planner. I spent all this time working on finance. Uh, what I've found, my obsession over the last two years, psychology and, and uh, sociology. These are things that I kept running into, questions I couldn't answer. And I found that like there's, there's the people who have actually figured this stuff out. When you have these huge complex systems, you have gatekeepers that are specialists. But when you have very localized, broad systems, what you see is that people who have a lot of broad knowledge are the ones who can make connections and actually solve problems. We're entering into a realm where it's not going to be how many initials you have behind your name or uh, how many degrees that you have, uh, but how much you know. And you can learn a lot by talking to other people, by reading, by just opening your mind. This brings me to the third thing and, and the last thing before I run out of time here, and that is this. Uh, in a system, in a world where we have a crisis of big and things are trying to localize, and we have generalists who uh, are taking place of the specialists, generalists who get broad things, the, 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 the third skill that we need more than anything is the ability to relate to each other, to talk to each other. And, and, and not just to talk to each other, but to listen. And what we at Strong Towns have called listen intently and purposefully. Uh, I, I, I alluded to the, uh, the, the crisis that we had this week that is ongoing in my home state of Minnesota. Uh, I think if we step back and look at that, uh, we can see that this is a case of people not only not listening to each other, uh, but not deeply listening in a sense of not understanding. In a world that is localizing, the generalists will govern, especially those who can listen, deeply listen, and try to understand 
uh, the people in the world around them. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to a very great day. Take about five to ten minutes for Q&A. If anybody wants to ask a question, just stand up and project your voice. Any takers? Um, the question was how many California cities are members um, we, we don't have any cities as members, and we don't invite cities to be members. I actually think that a lot of the action today is, is happening at the city level, but it's not happening with city government. It's actually happening at the block and the neighborhood level with individuals. And so our organization is an organization of individuals, not uh, governments or organizations. We have some organizations that have... have donated money to us because they believe in what we're doing, but we don't have, uh, we're, we're, we're focused on individuals and what individuals can do to make their cities better. So my, my city here, is, on the, is on the throes of increasing sales tax. Yeah. That's all they know how to do. It's the only their energy yeah. pride and property. So how can a bunch of citizens uh, propose or uh, accomplish a better alternative to, you know, their Right. Well, right now we are in, and, and this is a lot of what my presentation this afternoon will be about. Uh, we're in the, what we call the desperation phase. Some people would call it the kicking the can down the road phase. Um, but we're in the desperation phase of this big experiment in a, a new way to build cities. Uh, one of the things that we see is that government's very desperate to kind of keep things going. Remember I talked about the big systems. Uh, the, the natural reaction of a big system is to try to continue to perpetuate itself, despite evidence to the contrary. Uh, the sales tax is, is a primary mechanism to do that. We've run out of other ways to raise revenue. Uh, when you look at California, California is kind of the poster child of what we call the growth Ponzi scheme. The idea that we would freeze taxes for everyone uh, yet see our costs go up. And so the way we meet our obligations is to encourage new growth. The new growth comes at, at deferred costs, uh, but with increased revenue today. The sales tax is kind of one of the end games of this. And we see cities kind of desperately going around raising sales taxes uh, and, and other things to try to patch things together. There is no way for individuals to fix that problem. And, you know, I, I think in many ways that those problems will have to run their course. What we talk about is how can individuals uh, working in their neighborhoods and their blocks uh, make life better today, actually start to put systems in place so that when we finally run out of road to kick the can down, uh, there's actually viable local economies there to move in, to grow, to pick up the slack. What about, what about eliminating what? Um, it's, it's fascinating because every time I come to California, uh, I run into people who say, what a, you know, Prop 13 is, is horrible and terrible. Prop 13 is distorting, there's no question. And Prop 13 has distorted uh, a lot of the local conversation you're having. But Prop 13 itself is not the problem. Prop 13 actually uh, gave you the feedback that it was supposed to give you, which is, hey, financially, this isn't working. The, the problem is that the feedback... Uh -uh. No. No, no. Prop 13 is, is, is... I'm not suggesting that Prop 13 should not be repealed. I'm suggesting that that's not going to solve the, your problem. <laughs> your problem is not a lack of tax revenue. Your problem is not excessive spending. Those are kind of the, 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 the two sides we're given, right? Do you want a top-down system of government? Do you want a top-down system of corporations? The reality is the problem that we face, and this is why I said California is a poster child, is a lack of financial productivity in the way we go about building. You can't have these elevated highways 
uh, and not have enough tax revenue, not have enough tax base to maintain them. You can't have the, the layout and the design that we see across all of California and have it pay off financially in a way that actually financially makes any sense. This is what I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'll give you a ton of examples. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not a tax problem. It's not a revenue problem. It's not a spending problem. It's a productivity problem. Our cities are not designed to be financially productive. Please, I know you had your hand up first earlier. Go ahead. Right. Right. So, so what are the? Uh, okay. Last question. Okay. So, yeah, I'll paraphrase it. So, what are the alternatives to uh, getting a bunch of degrees and having a bunch of initials behind your name? Because that still seems to be the thing that the gatekeepers look for when you're moving up. Um, yes, that is uh, here. Let me give you an, an alternative end of the spectrum. Uh, I was just in Detroit last month for a, a stretch. And one of the fascinating things you see in Detroit is that, yes, uh, it has gone through a bankruptcy, it has gone through a collapse, it has is, it is essentially arrived at the destination that all of our cities are on a trajectory to become. That Detroit, after World War II, took a, a very great solvent city and spread it out over a large range. Uh, when you take this much wealth and add this much liability to it, you lose the productivity. That's the financial productivity problem at the end of the day. So in Detroit now, you see a city that has, has collapsed and is starting to rebuild itself in ways that are fascinating and, 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 and really, I think, a model for us to go and learn from. Uh, what you see in these places is that uh, those things, just, they just don't matter. They just don't matter. If someone is willing to move to a neighborhood, is willing to invest their time and their energy in making it better, there's no gatekeepers asking those questions anymore. They've become, by, by just means of you know, the hierarchy of needs, what's important, those are not important anymore. Neither are you know, the building codes, the regulatory process, all those things that in California you've come to be, like this is the way we do business, in, in Detroit, those are wiped out. And what you're seeing is a different ecosystem emerging, uh, one that is very organic, very bottom up, and doesn't have a lot of those same kind of gatekeepers. I think the challenge for us is to say, okay, Detroit, uh, we can learn a lot from. How do we learn those lessons? How do we learn from what they've gone through without going through those things? And I, I think that's the, the, the real kind of social question that we have here out on the West Coast. But yeah, if you, if, if you want to live here, you are going to have the gatekeeper. If you want to go to Buffalo or Cleveland or Detroit or, or, or some other place in this country, uh, Memphis is a really good example where uh, they've kind of passed that phase. Uh, those things are all, they are, they are much diminished. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Great talk.